in the previous video I made, one of the most requested topics from you guys has been to create a video on internal shifts or paradigm shifts. And now that we're doing this more in-depth videos, I want to dedicate a whole video that goes deep into these internal shifts for you guys. And guys, these internal shifts, the skill of paradigm shifting is one of the most crucial, one of the most important skills you can learn for your relationship, not only for reconciliation, but also to just create thriving relationships in the future in general. So for example, you have Kelly here who've been struggling with combat PTSD for so many years, and he has tried medications in high doses from his therapist. He's tried counseling, but nothing worked until he tried this really key skill in um, paradigm shifting. And you have another client here on the right who has been struggling with this relationship for a very long time. And just by focusing on the internal shifts for six to nine months really made a massive difference in his relationship and not only helping him to reconcile, but also create a wonderful relationship going forward. And if you look at any of my client stories, you will hear the same pattern of stories where the internal shifts has been really the key catalyst for their growth, but also for the massive success they have in their life, but also in their relationship as well. Now, the method I'm going to teach you is going to be very different than what you'll find in any other videos or any other professionals you can find. But once you get this right, this will be very, very magical, guys, I'm telling you. Now, in case you're new to this channel, my name is Jeffrey, and I am a relationship and marriage coach. And I make videos that go really in depth into helping you with all the right skills you need to create that thriving relationship or in the short term, if you just want to reconcile as well. So I'm going to go into this video of internal shifts. Uh, I'm going to run down to you guys the basics of it, but I want to hear your comments below with any questions, any follow-ups you may have, anything that you want me to dive deeper on, just let me know. So if you want more content like this, just feel free to subscribe to this channel, but also click that bell button as well to be notified when I post new videos every single week. So let's look at, again, internal sh paradigm shifts and why this is really the fix to the silent killer in a lot of healthy romantic relationships. Now, first things first, let's talk about why should you care about these internal shifts anyway? Because a lot of people get really confused, right? Like, why is it that in a relationships program, you're talking to me about internal shifts? Can you just give me the things to say, things to do, et cetera? So the first reason why this is very crucial is that this is really the only way to build the five pillars. And it builds the five pillars in a direct way, but also an indirect way as well. So we talked about this in our masterclass before. If you haven't joined the masterclass, I leave the masterclass link down below for you. But let's revisit first why, you know, these five pillars that we talk about here, sexual passion, goal alignment, mutual admiration, with a base of uh, both types of safety is really the most crucial um, pillars you need in a relationship. And in fact, it is the only pillars you need if you want to create reconciliation or a thriving relationship. So to understand why I say this, let's do some thought experiments. So first question there, will the problems be problems if let's say you have safety, if you have admiration, alignment, sexual passion? So I want you to take a look at whatever problems you have right now. Would they still be problems if you had all these pillars? For example, right, if you are talking about the problem of irreconcilable differences, Will those that be a problem if you had the safety to express to each other, to listen to each other, if you have the admiration and alignment to be able to align on those things together? Of course not, right? So we always say the problems in a relationship are never the actual problem. It's never the problem that actually leads your partner to wanting to leave the relationship. It's the catch-22 brought upon by the fact that you don't have safety, admiration, alignment, sexual passion, etc. But we also talk about um, how each of these pillars here not only are crucial to that outcome of reconciliation, but also they're crucial for each other as well. For example, how can you create alignment if you don't have safety? If you don't have safety to share or listen to each other, how can you create alignment? Of course you cannot. You cannot admire someone that you cannot feel safe with. Think about it in your life. Can you feel safe with someone if you, let's say, cannot sh even share because you know, they can't take the tough truth or whatever it is. Can you admire someone like that? Of course not. And can you feel sexual passion for a relationship that doesn't have any goal alignment, any admiration, any safety? It's be very, very hard. 
So now that we understand like these are the five pillars you need, think about how crucial internal shifts are to creating each of the five pillars of the relationship directly. For example, let's just look at safety here. Can you feel safety with someone who likes to play victim a lot? Whenever problems come, they crumble. Um, they shift the blame on other people. Can you feel safe with someone who is tethered? Whenever you come home in a bad mood, for example, they also get in a bad mood because you're in a bad mood. Or they lack a bulletproof vest. Can you really feel safety with someone like that? Of course not. So just by mastering these internal shifts, you can start to create a lot of these pillars naturally directly. For example, for my relationship, uh, the reason I think a big reason why my partner feels this strong safety and admiration and alignment with me and the relationship as well is because she has seen that, hey, whenever I bring up difficult challenges, difficult problems to Jeff, it's okay. He can take it. He can listen to it. He, he's not playing victim. He's not tethered. He's not breaking his bulletproof vest. So that pattern of me uh, thriving through my internal shifts can create a lot of safety, admiration, alignment, and so on. So that should be pretty obvious to people. And the third thing also is that tactics will be quite useless without the internal shifts. So a lot of people that I talk to, they, I think they understand from watching a lot of videos what to say, what to do. But a lot of guys have a hard time following through and doing the right things naturally. Doing the right things for them is very difficult because again, they're trying to do the right things without making those internal shifts first. And that's a very dangerous place to be in. And it puts a lot of men in this very negative cycle where they learn something, they learn what they should do, for example, and they try very hard, they use their willpower to do the right things. But then of course, they, you know, this doesn't work. And so they try to do the right things. They eventually make the mistake. They regret the mistake. And once they regret it, they try and promise harder to not make, make the mistake in the future, but then they make the mistake again and they regret even harder. They try even harder and it keeps them in this very uh, negative cycle of regret, of pain, of just feeling guilty all the time. And this is why. So if you're feeling that, right, what you need is not more tactics. What you need is really the internal shifts. It's also crucial to lead and flip the script. So we talked about this in a lot of videos before. Uh, we talk about the paradox of change. So if you want to watch that video, I left a link uh, down below for you to that video on paradox of change. But the paradox of change is basically the natural distrust and resistance that you will get when you try to change massively. And this is something that happens in every part of life. This happens for me during work, for example. You know, before this job, I was a data science. Uh, I, I was in data science. And when I announced to my partner and all my friends and all my family that, hey, I'm changing my career away from data science into relationships, people started to resist. People started to distrust and doubt and get suspicious of that. Are you sure? And this always starts very externally, meaning it starts with other people giving you that resistance. And the same thing for my relationship. You know, when I started to change the way I talk, the way I think, the way I conducted myself in relationships, my partner would say, Oh, you sound like a therapist. You sound fake, right? You naturally get that resistance. And if you watch any of my client interviews, you will see that all my clients kind of face the same paradox of change, the same distress and resistance. You will face it. It's almost like a rite of passage whenever you want to change. And your partner's not doing this out of malice. She's not doing this to be kind of an asshole or just to be difficult. In fact, if you really look at your own behavior, your own life, you will see that you actually do the same thing. You actually give other people paradox of change. So I want you to imagine here, someone has been hurting you a lot for a lot of a long time. And suddenly they say to you, oh my God, I'm going to change, right? I'm, I have changed. Would you believe them right away when they tell you that you, they have changed? Of course not. You would be suspicious. You would be doubtful. You would be a bit more resistant. And that's exactly what your partner is doing. Because usually when your partner wants to leave and it feels very hopeless about the relationship, that's the moment when things, you know, she's been burned so many times. She, you know, she's unhappy. You make some promises and she gets, that gets her hopes up. And suddenly you show evidence to counter the fact that you've changed. So you destroy that hope again. Then you make another promise and you destroy that hope again. And she's been burned so many times that now she's like, I don't want to be burned again. I, I, 
you know, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me 50 times, really shame on me. And so now when you're about to change, when you change, when you say you cha you're changing, when you show your changes, it's going to come with a lot of suspicions and doubt. Naturally, you would do the exact same thing. And But the funny thing about patterns of change is that what you do during the practice of change, when you get this distress, when you get these suspicions, when you get these resistance, will tell your partner and will tell the world really everything they need to know about your changes. So, you know, when people give you suspicions and doubt of your changes, for example, it can come in a very active way, in an anger, angry way, for example, in a stoic way where they're just cold and indifferent or a passive way where they're just stonewalling or giving you the cold shoulder. But whenever you get this resistance, I want you guys to see that as tests. So to understand this, let's reverse the roles a little bit. Let's imagine again that you're dealing with someone who has hurt you many times, and now they're saying they've changed. And of course, naturally, you start to get suspicious. Hmm, I don't know. Have you really changed? And upon seeing your suspicions, they just crumble. Like, ah, oh, fine. You know, if you don't think I've changed, then whatever. And they go back to their old self, right? They stop trying to change. They stop believing in their changes. They stop wanting to change and they just go back on everything they said. What would you think? You would think, hmm, maybe they haven't changed. I mean, like if their changes can crumble so quickly like that upon the first suspicion, how, how real can their changes be? But if you see their behavior again and you see, okay, I give them suspicion, but even though I give him suspicions for three months, for six months, for a year, they're still their new self. They're still changing. They're still growing. You know, if you see that, eventually you'll say, maybe these changes are real. I've tried to put this through many tests, but I, I, I just can't poke a hole in this. They, they're, they have really changed. And so sometimes, you know, I see clients who they'll say to us or they'll say to their partner, right? Partner, I'll do anything to change. I'll do everything and anything to change. I'll do, trust me, like you, you'll see, I'll, I'll change. And then the partner says like, uh, don't change for me, change for someone else. It's too late. Please don't waste your time. Or they might even get angry at them for changing for some, for some reason. And instantly the client goes like, okay, fine. If you don't want me to change, then fine then. I, I, I feel demotivated. What they don't realize again is that them giving up during paradox of change will tell their partner everything they need to know. So for example, I showed my clients this video a while back and I want to show you this because it's a perfect example of what it's like when you fail through the paradox of change, okay? I'm in a better place in my life. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not, you know, I'm not out there committing crimes now, you know, and I feel like I should be given a shot. I appreciate that, but I think it's time that you get a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. In accordance with the laws of state of Nevada, this court. No. You know, this can look ridiculous, guys, but this is actually what you guys do when you say, I want to change. Hey, I deserve better. Hey, I have changed. And then once you get the resistance, you crumble. If you crumble, maybe you don't <laughs> act like as bit as this guy, but if you crumble, you're basically showing the judge here or your partner here that like, I was right to leave. I was, it, it was good to leave because the changes aren't real. You're just saying whatever it is you need to say. But imagine this guy after he gets the sentencing, instead of acting like that, he further shows that he has reformed. He has changed. He, he is different. Sure, he may not get the judge to overturn the decision right now, but I can guarantee you that if he keeps putting on his best behavior and eventually the judge is going to start to change their mind, right? Eventually. But right now, because you crumble during patterns of change, you're making that eventual success something that's impossible. And so you have to understand that this patterns of change can come in infinite forms, but it's a necessary rite of passage to build trust after it's destroyed. It's crucial guys. And without the right internal shifts, it'll be impossible for you to flip the script through POC, through patterns of change. So again, because you know a lot of people, they're ridden with the victim mindset. They're, they don't have strong paradigm shifts. They see their partner's resistance in the wrong way. They interpret it as a bad thing. So when their partner tells them it's hopeless, they also think it's hopeless. And because they haven't made these internal shifts, they cannot help but crumble during patterns of change. 
Sure, they can pass some tests, but eventually they will just crumble. So again, internal shifts, crucial to build the five pillars, crucial to lead and flip the script through the patterns of change, but it's also crucial to, to getting what we call falling outcomes. And relationships is actually a very falling outcome. So I already discussed this in another video. You can uh, look at the video and the link in the description if you want to dive deeper on this. But in life, you have two different kinds of outcomes. You have striving and falling. Striving outcomes is, for example, like when you're lifting weights. The more willpower you exert, the more pressure you give yourself to lift that weight, the more weight you can lift. For example, here, the for striving outcomes, the more willpower, the more you get the outcome. But falling outcomes are like sleeping or taking a break, for example. The more energy, the more willpower you exert to, fall, uh, to falling asleep, the less likely you actually fall asleep, right? And they call it falling in love for a reason, because love is a very falling thing. So if you're struggling right now with your partner not trusting or believing or seeing the genuineness of your changes, for example, or the uh, permanency of your changes, is usually because you lack the internal shifts to allow the your partner to fall back into the relationship, right? And we talk about this internal shift of tetheredness versus untetheredness. And tetheredness, again, is doing because you want to have. So your doing is tethered to the having versus untethered, which is doing because you are. So it's untethered from the having. It's tethered to the process. So I want you to imagine you get a gift from someone and you can tell that they're doing this act of giving you the gift because they want, and you can sense that they want something in return. They want some having in return. Can you believe that that gift is genuine? Can you take that gift properly? Of course not. It'd be much harder. But if you have someone who gives you the gift and you can tell from their microtones, their micro expressions, who they are, et cetera, that they're giving the gift because they are someone who loves seeing you to be happy, who loves the giving gifts in general, then you can really start to receive that gift much easier. And this is the same with a lot of people in relationships. You know, people are changing, people are doing nice things, people are doing good things in their relationship, but their partner doesn't believe them. Why? Because they can sense. Their spidey senses are tingling, boop, 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 right? Oh, I can sense that they're doing this but they're only doing this because they want something in return. They want me back. They want me to do this, for example. When your changes are tainted, poisoned by tetheredness, that will ruin everything. So if you don't have the right internal shifts again, you will never, it'll be very hard for you to create these falling outcomes. It's also the key to lasting results. So the reason why, you know, if you look at a lot of our client stories, we don't get a lot of people relapsing. We also, if you join our program, you also get a lot of people who stick with the program for their whole, whole life, basically. You know, we have people who reconciled two, three years ago, they're still in the program and doing the program. And the reason why is that, you know, once you make your changes into something that you do because you are, not something you do just because you want to have, that's when everything just becomes more effortless. It's like, you know, whether you're tired, whether you're sleepy, your initial and your automatic uh, response, your automatic default is to do the right things because you really programmed it like a performer. It's also, you know, the key to creating this positive feedback loop within yourself where if you don't have these internal shifts, doing the right things will always seem like you're swimming against the current. And you see a lot of people uh, going through this where they know what the right things to do are. They know what they need to become. They know what the right things to say and do are in a relationship but doing them seems hard. So they can try for three months, for six months, but eventually they can't fake it. They lose energy, they lose willpower, and it's just a really bad feedback loop. So before we get into the what and the how of paradigm shifts and paradigm shifting, let's start with some basics of how emotions actually work in our bodies. You know, So a lot of people, they think that events cause your emotions. So people say things like, for example, oh, because my partner said this, I feel this, causes the emotions, but that's actually not the case. What really happens is that your interpretations are the ones that cause your emotions. So whenever an event happens, you see it through your interpretations, you make an interpretation of it, and the interpretation is what causes your emotions. 
And we know that the events don't cause the emotions, but interpretations do. Because, you know, if you put, let's say, 100 people in the same room, those 100 people looking at the same event are going to have 100 wildly different emotions. Why? Because they're interpreting it in 100 wildly different ways. Uh, and a great example of this, too, is my videos. If you go to the comment section of my videos, right? Some people look at the videos that I make and they say, I love it. I love it. It's great, right? This is hopeful. But some people take the same video and they feel offended by it. They feel upset by it, right? Why is that? It's not the video itself that is causing the emotion. It's the way they interpret it. Same thing with the program. And I made a video about this last week. You know, for example, tough love. We give tough love in our program. We openly admit that. Now, a lot of people will say, I, I get a tough love and I feel threatened. I feel upset. Well, the tough love cannot really make you feel upset. It's the way you interpret it. Because there's a lot of people in my program who get tough love, but they interpret it positively. Oh, I need this tough love. This is good for me. And they feel good things about the tough love. But if you interpret this negatively, then of course you're going to feel negative things. One more example of this is you know, uh, the way I see problems. Right? I made a video about this before, but whenever my partner tells me or my employees tell me something, a bad news, a problem, I see that as a positive thing. Why? Because I interpret it as a positive thing, right? I say to myself, for example, oh, these are the problems, the negative confirmation biases that have been killing my relationship for a very long time. And now that I know about it, this is good. And now that I know about it, I can do something about it. I can fix it. And I can also show my partner that this is how I handle problems, right? So I see that's an opportunity. So because I see it this way, I see uh, problems and her telling me problems as a good thing. But if you see it as a wrong thing, like a lot of people do, a lot, a lot of people, they discover some tough truth, the partner tells them some tough truth, and because they haven't changed the way they interpret it, right, you can take the same event and they feel negative things about it. So again, this is the basic, basic thing you need to understand here. And this is crucial because what you feel will determine your actions. You know, humans, they act from emotion, right? Even though you think you're logical, you act from emotion. And whatever you do determines your outcome. So what's interesting is, you know, if you want to change your outcome, it really starts here. Like a lot of people try to change their actions, but really, if you want to change your actions, you're going to change your emotions about it. Which is why we say earlier, right? If you change this, if you change this without this, you are trying to do an action and forcing an action, even though you feel bad about it. This creates a lot of incongruence that will make this action very difficult or ingenuine looking. But if you change this, you'll naturally make this effortless and you naturally make this effortless too, the right outcomes effortless too. So if interpretations are what determines an emotion and, and emotions what determines actions and outcome, right? What determines uh, your interpretations is your paradigms, is how you see the world. So if your paradigm about, uh, for example, finding out about tough truths is bad, then your interpretation will naturally be bad as well. And you will naturally feel bad things, you will do bad things, you will get bad things. Okay, but if you see that, if you change your paradigms, your reflexive interpretation is going to be positive, emotions are going to be positive, actions positive, and so on. So you see how everything stems from this. I have a lot of people who uh, come to the program or who apply for the program and they have their partner feeling hopeless. They see their partner feeling hopeless. It's like, oh my God, if she's hopeless, I mean, there's no hope then. It takes two to tango anyway. If she doesn't want to try, then what the fuck is the point of even trying? So their emotion is also hopeless. Well, if your emotion is hopeless, then you will also act in a hopeless way, right? And if you act in a hopeless way, you get more of the outcome. If you don't try. Now, the funny thing though, is that there is kind of a feedback loop here. So let's say, okay, that guy who feels hopeless does hopeless things and gets more hopeless outcomes. When he gets his hopeless outcome, he will filter this through his hopeless paradigms and he will basically say to himself, see, I knew it. I knew this was hopeless. And so this kind of uh, adds fuel to this bad paradigm, which adds fuel to the future interpretations. And this starts this really negative feedback loop. And you can also have this feedback loop from emotions as well. You know, and this is what we call the emotional flywheel. So 
I don't know if you guys have ever been depressed before, right? But within, so let's say, you know, one day you're watching a comedy show and you are on your couch watching this comedy show. It's supposed to be funny, it's supposed to be uh, making you feel good, but then you think about something that upsets you, right? So the event is you think about something that upsets you, you make a negative interpretation about that, you feel negative emotions, and then you filter this through your negative paradigms, and this goes really fast within a split second. And you'll find that within a few seconds, you're really upset about something. You're really upset about something. Nothing new really happened, but it's just this flywheel happening. And a lot of you guys have feel, felt this too. So this is really the, the, the feedback loop, the feedback cycle, the flywheel, as we call it, of emotions, where you feel worse and worse emotions. But as you feel worse and worse emotions, you will feel more and more justified, more and more right for feeling those things because you're just fueling those paradigms over and over and over again. And this is why, again, in the previous video and in this video too, I'm going to say that the reason why this, this niche, coaching this niche is so hard is because we're trying to get people to see that whatever they feel is not really reality. Whatever they feel is really in the eye of the beholder kind of thing, where whatever you feel, it may feel right to you. It may feel like that's reality to you, but it's not reality. It's the reality you created because of these loops. So you ever talk to a person who's depressed, for example, you know, you, they feel very negative emotions, obviously. And you try to, let's say, tell them, Hey dude, like you need to see the brighter sides to life, etc." They won't buy it. It's really hard to snap people out of depression and anxiety because they have let this flywheel run for so long that it's like trying to stop a moving truck. It's impossible. So we always say, for example, to people that, Hey, whenever your partner tells you that it's hopeless, right? Event, you should feel very positive emotions about it because you should see it in this way. And if you feel positive emotions about it, you should do positive things. Here's what you can do. And you get this outcome. But a lot of people still don't believe that because they have let this a paradigm, this flywheel of, okay, if my partner tells me it's hopeless, uh, my paradigms tell me it's hopeless. So I'll interpret it in a hopeless way. This will be hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. And if I get the hopeless outcome, this will feed back into confirming this and so on and so on and so on. And so they have gone, let this gone so long that it's impossible to convince them otherwise anymore. It's impossible. But now that we talk about those basics, let's talk about, okay, so what does it mean to internal shift or paradigm shift anyway? Well, it's really simple, actually. So if you look at a lot of the existing solutions around emotional management, paradigm shifting, internal shifting. Most solutions operate up top here, right? Uh, they operate, uh, let me go back here again. They operate right, one sec. They operate right here, okay? They operate right here. So either they try to change your emotion directly. So you do it through like breathing exercises. You do it through journaling, for example. You do it to mantras or they try to change the interpretations, right? Uh, through mantras again, or actions. They try to just tell you like, hey, whatever you do, just please don't do this. So basically like, I know you're gonna want to do X, Y, Z, but please do A, B, C instead. Like think about it. Think about all the solutions you have in the world today and they always operate up here. But the problem with operating up here again is that usually the flywheel has happened so many times. Again, it's like trying to stop a moving truck or moving train even. So I don't know if you have done this before, right? So you take one uh, solution, which is for example, breathing. Let's say you have an event that causes you to feel very angry. You're upset. Would you even remember to breathe at that point? No, because you're already, already too upset, right? So we always say trying to fix the emotion after they have formed is like trying to, basically trying to clench your asshole to keep your shit in. Eventually, you're going to diarrhea. It's going to go everywhere. And this is why a lot of people stay stuck in this cycle where, you know, they know, for example, their emotions are wrong um, and they're doing wrong things because of their emotions. And they keep promising to do better and better and better, but they keep failing. So whenever they fail, 
they promise to do better again, they fail again, they promise to do better again, and they keep feeling the cycle of guilt, of remorse, of like, man, maybe I can't do this. It's just this operating here is not good. So whatever solutions we want to have needs to operate here because this is the fuel to this, and this is the fuel to this, and so on. So if you look at that principle, this is what we should change. Not here, not here. We shouldn't try to change the event. Not here, not here, etc. And why our approach are so effective. So our approach fixes things here. Okay. So when we say paradigm shifting, we're really talking about how do we shift this guy right here, this pal right here. So we need to figure out a way to reprogram these paradigms. For example, in the example that I showed you, if you fix the problem of, okay, let me change the way I see problems. Let me change the way I see issues, for example. Whenever an event happens, uh, and this is a true story, we blew a tire uh, two weeks ago, right? A lot of people will say, oh, what a inconvenience. But I have learned to change my paradigms around those kind of problems. And I interpret it as like, oh, this is good. You know, now um, me and my wife can spend more time together in the car. Uh, she can see how I can operate during crisis, for example, how calm I can be. This is good. This is a really good opportunity. Because I've changed my paradigms about stuff like that, my interpretations become a lot more positive now. And, and this happens automatically, right? And automatically, I feel positive emotion. Automatically, I'll start to do positive things. And guess what? We get more positive outcomes. And when I get those positive outcomes, I will, again, go back to this and go, you know what? This is why I changed my paradigms. This is the value of it. And I start to have a very different cycle. And all of this happens without me trying to make it happen. It just happens reflexively because I change this and this creates reflexive this and this and this. There's no clenching your asshole to keep your shit in anymore. Okay. The emotion, the bad emotions don't even arise. Only good emotions arise. Now, the other thing too, is we also need to think about what we call the obliviously blind. And to understand this one, we have what is called the rewards and punishment paradox. And if you are a follower of my videos, you will see this uh, being talked about quite a lot already. But basically, you know, if you look at any good habits that you can think of, what happens? Good habits, they punish you now. They punish you now, but they reward you much later. Do you eat that salad? Oh, it's painful to eat that salad. But you may not get the rewards of eating that salad consistently for another 5, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is. You work out now. Oh, you feel the pain now, but you may not get the reward till months or even years later sometimes, right? So any good habits you can think of, they punish you now, but they reward you later. But any bad habits, think about it, smoking, they reward you now with a nicotine hit, but you may not get lung cancer till decades later. So the reason why this is crucial to understand is that, you know, when people are having internal shift issues, what they're really facing is they falling, they're falling for victim mindsets and they're falling for what we call the disguises of desires. For example, one of the uh, victim mindsets that we teach in our program is called the unique circumstance illusion. It's this illusion that people have that they want to tell themselves that their situation is unique. Why do people do that? Because, okay, think about this. If you tell yourself your situation is unique, that is so different, that nobody else ever has faced the situation before, there is no solution to this because your case is so unique. You get to get the reward, the immediate reward of absolving yourself of having to do any work. Because, you know, so let's say people are giving you solutions, right? And people are telling you, hey, man, there's a solution to this. Like, your problem is not really a big problem. It's not really a problem, actually. It's been fixed before. If you say to the world and to other people, like, no, no, you don't understand. My problem is, has no solution. That absolves you of the need to find the solution, to do the solution, to work on the solution. Because now you can just excuse yourself by saying, like, well, there's no solution. So why? I, I, of course I didn't do anything. There's no solution, right? So it rewards you with the satisfaction that you don't have to do anything. But... Again, it punishes you later. You know, a lot of people come to the program and they feel the sense of urgency. I want to learn how, what to say. I want to learn what to do. And so when we tell people, hey, 
before you learn what to say and do, you need to learn the internal shifts, identity shifting, even you need to learn how to learn. People get really antsy. Oh my God, they, they rush the program, right? So when they rush the program like that, they get the reward of, yeah, I'm getting what I want, which is I want the tactics, right? I want the tactics. I want the manipulation. But again, they get punished later. So the point here is that, you know, if you look at any victim mindsets, any DODs, any layers of the bulletproof vest that we teach, they always fall on the wrong side of this rewards and passion paradox where playing victim, falling for the disguise of desire really rewards you now, but they'll punish you later. And that's why our minds and bodies always gravitate towards these things. If left to its own devices, we want to do this, which is why also, if you look at life, um, we always accidentally adopt bad habits. Well, when was the last time you accidentally adopted good habits? It never happens because bad habits have the same MO. They reward you now, they punish you later. Victim mindsets, DODs have the same MO. They punish you, they reward you now, they punish you later. So the reason why people blindly fall for the bad paradigms is because the bad paradigms are easier. They reward you now. But this will always put you in a never ending cycle of blindness. For example, okay? People falling for the unique secret of solution. And there's a reason why we don't take clients who want to insist that their case is unique. Because if you think your case is unique, you're gonna get an event, you're gonna interpret that as like, no, no, no solution here. You're gonna feel hopeless. And from that, you don't act on anything. Well, if you don't act on anything, your outcome is still remains shit. And when your outcome remains shit, you will tell yourself, see, I knew it. I knew there was nothing I could do. And this continues the cycle. You see that? And the same thing with our disillusion. To understand this one, you know, I, I want you to imagine uh, that game we played in school. You know that game we played like, oh, you have these building blocks. I want you to take these building blocks and build the tallest tower you can within a given amount of time, right? So let's say group A starts to build a tower up right away. Doesn't build a solid base, up right away. Group B takes some time to build a solid base. All right. In the short term, group A will feel that reward of, oh my God, I they're looking at group B and going like, oh my God, what fucking losers. I'm, I'm so much higher. Right. And group B feels that punishment of, oh my God, group A is really overtaking me right now. And I'm just like setting up my base right now. Right. So urgency illusion has an immediate reward. But Going forward, right? Eventually, because group B has built a solid base, they keep going higher and higher and higher. And eventually, A will realize that, oh, because I don't have a solid foundation, I cannot build it higher anymore. It keeps crumbling back down after it reaches a certain height. Guess what? Eventually, group B is going to be so high, and group A is going to look at B and go, oh my God, I need to get there. And guess what they do, right? Um, so, they have the paradigm of urgency illusion. They interpret things as like, I got to go fast. So the emotion is like, oh my God, urgency. Action is urgency. Outcome is urgency. And this repeats. So what happens with a lot of my clients is like, they see group B has risen so high and now they're looking at group B and now they're using the same urgency to be like, okay, now I really don't have time to build the solid foundations. Right? And they go, they double down on the urgency even more. And this is just like this recipe to just a cycle of just doom. You can see that. Again, the point is this. Whatever victim mindset you have or DODs you have, you're always going to be blind to it. And you're always going to feel like what you feel is right, is justified, but it's only right and justified because you made it so. But they're not always objectively right or objectively justified. It's just what you feel like it. So whatever effective mechanism we need to paradigm shifting needs to take this paradox into account because we need to let yourself cut through your own denial, your own bullshit in a way, your own blind spots for you to see that this cycle right here, even though this feels right to you, whatever paradigms you have because of the self-confirming thing, it's not always right. And that if you want to change your outcome and if you want to change your actions, 
And if you want to change your emotions, you got to start by changing this. Okay, so the next question becomes, well, okay, so how do I do this? And this is where we go to the meat of this video. And really the system is quite simple. In our program, we teach the three uh, uh, stage flow. We call the first stage the seat of consciousness. And that is basically a fancy word that we have used to basically um, uh, suggest like the, observ the observation of your emotions. Once you observe the emotions, you shift it. And once you shift it, you observe the new emotions. So you can think of this almost like Tai Chi. You know, uh, emotions is like taking the emotions that you have, the old emotions, the negative emotions, observing that, shifting it, and observing the new emotions. So, you know, if you do Tai Chi, right, you go poo and you flow, poo. Basically, this is like doing Tai Chi, but in your mind. So let's go deeper into this a little bit. What is seed of consciousness? It's basically the ability to observe your emotions as they are without judgment. And a lot of people call this different things. Uh, some people call this mindfulness or, or consciousness, whatever it is. But there's a lot of books on mindfulness and consciousness. But what is the point of this? Number one, we want to avoid what we call the purple giraffe paradox. And this is a really interesting paradox. Um, I can give two examples for this one. You know, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, I grew up in Asia. I mean, in Asia, uh, everyone smokes. So I've been smoking since I was 14. And this is a habit I've been trying to kick for the majority of my life. And I was never conscious of it. I was never successful at kicking it because I was falling into the purple to drive paradox. So for example, whenever I would have the temptation to smoke, I would make myself guilty for having the temptation to smoke. And that guilt that I add gives me more anxiety. And that more anxiety actually creates more of a temptation to smoke. <laughs> See what I mean? Same thing for anger. Let's say you're angry. And now you feel angry for being angry. You feel guilty for being angry. And that guilty for being angry makes you even more angry. And so telling yourself, stop being angry, actually makes you more angry. Do you see the purple giraffe paradox? And the reason why we call it the purple giraffe paradox is, if I tell you right now, do not think of a purple giraffe. What do you think about? The purple giraffe. When in life do you ever think about a purple giraffe? Never. The only reason why you're thinking about purple giraffe is because I told you not to think about it. Do you see the paradox here? So this is why they say, what you resist will persist. If you try to not do something, if you try to resist something, the more they will persist. So a lot of people, the problem they have is when they feel angry, for example, when they feel some negative emotion, they resist it. They feel guilty for it. They push it away and they go, I shouldn't be feeling that. Go away. They think that that will actually uh, allow them to not feel the emotions, but that, that actually makes it worse. So the reason why we need to observe the old emotions as they are without judgment is because we want to get out of this purple giraffe paradox. So whenever I feel the temptation to smoke, what really worked for me was when I felt the temptation, I just observed that temptation. And I just saw it and go, hmm, there it is. You know, one of my uh, mindfulness mentors, he's always telling me, hey, whenever you feel something bad, throw a party for them, invite them in. Hello, everybody, right? You want to do the same thing. Whenever you feel angry, just observe that anger. And just doing this alone, you'll find does wonders in releasing that emotion and catching those emotions. So if you guys have been angry before, a lot of you guys will realize that the moment, the moment you snap out of your anger is the exact moment when you say to yourself, wait, 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 this is getting too far, right? So once you're able to take yourself out of that and observe your anger, that's when you realize you snap out of your anger. Isn't that funny? So this is not only to avoid you going into the spiral, but also it will help you release. Not only that, the third thing that is really crucial for my clients is that it builds emotional li literacy. A lot of men now, right, when they feel something, they never really dive deeper into what they feel. They just kind of like resist it, push it away, sweep it under the rug and let it go. But that's why a lot of men, they don't really know how to articulate their feelings. They don't even know how what they're feeling. And if you don't know what you're feeling, you cannot relate. You cannot understand what other people are feeling. 
And if you cannot understand what other people are feeling, you cannot create safety. So this emotional literacy is a crucial part to creating safety. But the, the best way to build this is you feel whatever you feel. For example, whenever I feel angry, whenever I feel sick now, you know, I'm having a cold right now, so I, I sound about, a, a bit nasally. But whenever I'm sick, whenever I'm going through something bad, I just feel it. I feel what it's like to feel bad. But what that does is now it builds my emotional literacy for that thing. For example, you know, up to a couple of years ago, I've never actually felt what a fever feels like. And so whenever people would call in sick to my, in my company, I would always kind of like think in my head, like what fucking pussies, you know, like, come on, it's just a fever. It can't be that bad. Get over it. But then I had my COVID shot and I got injected. I had the worst reaction. I had such a bad fever. I couldn't even see light for two days. And I finally realized, oh my God, this is what fever feels like. My whole body was aching. I was in chills. It was painful. I was in agony. But now, whenever someone tells me they have a fever, I can not only understand what that feels like, but I can articulate that feeling because during the whole two days I was having a fever, I was observing it. I wasn't trying to push it away. I was observing it. Right? It builds emotional literacy. So how do you do this? I'm not going to go too deep into this because this is a whole um, section of our course, a long section of our course that's like hours and hours long. It takes time, but it's a skill you build. Basically, the main gist is that you want to practice what we call walking meditation. So where at every moment in time, as you're living life, every waking moment is you being in that seat of consciousness, in the back side of your head, where you're just simply observing everything as they are without judgment. Good things are happening, you go, hmm, interesting. Bad things are happening and you go, interesting. You're just observing things and you're just observing them deeply and objectively. And to build the skill, check out um, the style of meditation called Vipassana or just mindfulness in general. So again, I talked to you about like how I anger with my, uh, dealt with my anger problems, my addiction problems. This is massive. And once you unlock the skill of seat of consciousness, that's amazing. But once you observe that old feelings, you want to go to what we call the shift. The shift is basically creating an effective auto-suggestion that allows you to see the absurdity of the old paradigms and coming up with a new one to replace it. Okay, uh, and I'll talk more about the details of this in a bit, but why this is crucial again? Okay, if you go back to this chart of, of interpretations, whatever it is, right? Basically what's happening is that your existing paradigms have become so entrenched in your mind because they know exactly what to say to you to tempt you with immediate rewards and de delayed punishment. But they know how to tempt you with this. They know what buttons to press, right? So the reason why, again, a lot of people have fallen for this core paradigms, the wrong paradigms, is because these paradigms are very tempting. They, they give you a lot of rewards, a lot of satisfaction in the beginning. Now, what we need to do with our reinterpretations then is we need to come up with an even stronger voice to counter the voices of the paradox. And as you farm more auto suggestions, you can use these to reprogram your mind in the long term or rescue you in the short term. And this may not make sense to you guys right now. I get it. So uh, give me five minutes and I'll explain this to you guys. Okay. But basically, how do I create a shift? First of all, we want to catch what we call the right mind viruses. And you know, the reason why we call it mind virus is that, so just like a body, a virus of the body, for example, you go somewhere and you catch the virus. The virus comes in, it starts to multiply in your body. And then when it multiplies enough, you get really sick. And it might even change what you do and the outcome of your life. It might even kill you in some instances, right? Mind virus are the same thing. You know, um, we see a movie, we see, uh, we go with our friends, we, uh, whatever, and we get a paradigm oh, inside there. This paradigm, if it's toxic, it's a mind virus. And that, my, and that paradigm, like we said, starts to fester, replicate, fester, replicate, evolves into something stronger and stronger and stronger. And that mind virus will determine how you feel, will determine how you act, and it will determine your life. And what we found is that, there's really what we call the big 14 mind viruses. 
So for example, for the victim mindsets, we have um, the five daily victim mindsets. This is the five daily strains of victim mindsets that we catch. So there's five there. We also have the seven disguise of desire here. And then we have also some more other ones like um, antithetic thinking or hypothetic thinking as a virus and also FA bias as a, a virus. Also, um, your um, your your allergy to resistance as a virus. So we have the big 14 that we call it in our program. So basically, the first thing you want to do when you feel something bad, when you are here and you observe something, a bad feeling, you want to catch, okay, which of the big 14 is this? Is this unique circumstance? Is this urgency illusion? Is this important solution? You want to find like what exact mind virus strain do I have, right? If you are sick in your body, you got to go to the doctor to, for your doctor to tell you, okay, here's the strain of virus. And depending on what strain of virus you have, that determines the medication you get, right? If you don't identify what mind virus you have, then you cannot even identify what is your treatment plan. So that's the same thing. You want to identify you want to find out what is the strains of mind virus that I have. Once you do that, you want to create what we call a reinterpretation or an auto suggestion with the right structure, MO, and what we call the thriving nature. So this is an example of the structure we have for reinterpretations, right? So whatever reinterpretations we have needs to have these five components right here. So number one is basically, uh, let me see if I can. So number one basically is, what are the old voices? So what are the old voices telling you? Basically, the old voices again are telling you um, some combination of rewards and punishment. For example, falling for unique circumstance illusion, you should be clear like, okay, this voice is telling me that my case is unique, my case is different, and so because it's different, there's no solution. So for example, if you fall for the unique circumstance illusion, you always say, you know what? If I look back at my life, this has really prevented me from seeing and entertaining solutions that are actually there for my problems because I just dismiss it without even trying to look at it. What the fuck am I doing? And we use a lot of obscenities here. We use a lot of the word fuck, for example, because like, again, your old voices have a very strong voice. It has a very compelling voice. And we want to have an even more compelling voice for you to talk back to the old voices. So if you're too afraid to... Just tell yourself with passion the absurdity of these voices that you have in the past and how it's fucked you in the past. You're never going to create a voice that's stronger. And then you also ask yourself, how is it tricking you now? Because again, just like um, the urgency example, for example, right? Uh, if you fall for the urgency illusion, you can say, for example, what are the old voices? Oh my God, uh, I don't have time to worry about internal shifts. I don't have time to worry about all these basic stuff. I need to learn how to talk to my wife right now. I need to have conversations right now. And to be honest, like, okay, this voice has fucked me so much in the past. It's led me to skip and take shortcuts on key skills and key foundations that I haven't needed to take shortcuts on. And do you realize how it's tricking me now? Okay. For example, if you go back to the example of the, um, the the two towers again, I use the urgency illusion to skip creating a base. And now because I don't have the base, I my tower cannot be tall. And now that I see other people's tower being tall, the urgency illusion again is telling me, now you really don't have time to build the foundation. But are you... Do you realize how fucking ridiculous this is, right? So you really have to talk to yourself like that. Then we want to shift. So now that we saw how absurd the old ways of thinking is, the, the mind viruses, whether that's urgency, illusion, important solution, we want to show, okay, so if that's ridiculous, what do we shift to? So for example, if you have the unique circumstance illusion again, you want to find some processes to be like, hey, so forget all that stuff. What you want to focus on is X. What you want to focus on is Y. But then what you want to focus on is Z. Okay. Then you want to mythologize that process and say, if you focus on X, if you focus on Y, then Z, you will get this outcome. You will get this. You will feel this. You will feel this. And so you start to legendarize and mythologize that new thing you're shifting to. 
So basically, if you think about it, this is a shift. You're shifting the old by telling yourself how fucking absurd this old thing is. And you're finding the new thing to focus on. And you're mythologizing this one. And that's the structure of that autosuggestion. And when you have the right structure, we call it the gun. And you have the right ammo as well, coupled with the right structure. And, and in our program, we give you a lot of ammo. So this is kind of like our library for all the looms that we have, right? So if you type in the word ammo, for example, we give you a lot of ammo. For example, here's um, the Unicycle Health Illusion uh, VM ammo, right? Uh, equal Blame Illusion ammo, for example. So you can find a lot of ammo based on what other people have created. And you can even type in the word unique, for example, and you can see that, oh, there's a lot more ammo here as well. All right, so basically, when you couple the right structure with the right ammunition, with the right things, with the right key arguments that will just convince you right away, this is that is going to be so massive. And when you couple that with what we call the thriving nature, the right tone, like if you are willing to just cuss at yourself, you know, some people in my clients, uh, some of my clients, for example, put music on there. They talk at, with poetry, for example. So you add the right gun, the right ammo, and the right caliber, right? This will trump your old voice over and over and over again. Okay. So really, if you picture auto suggestions, it's almost like as if you are standing in front of a version of yourself that is in the past. And you're trying to shake the living bejesus of this guy. What the fuck are you doing? Do you realize what you're doing? But you're not just punching the guy. You're also giving the guy a lot of great ammo. Right? So you're not just having the thriving nature, but you're also make sure, uh, making sure that you have the right ammo, the right things, the right convincing arguments. So I'd love to go deeper into this topic, but um, that's probably a topic for a whole other video where we go into the right structure, the right ammo, the right thriving nature, right? But again, the structure here should be the same for everybody, but the ammo and the thriving nature is something subjective. I cannot give you the ammo. I can inspire the ammo for you, but I cannot give you the right ammo. And I already gave you some examples of some of the ones that I created uh, around urgency, for example, around unique circumstance, but basically, once you shift this, so basically you, you observe, you observe and you look at the absurdity of the old emotions and you shift it to something new. You want to observe the new emotion again. You know, a really great auto suggestion should make you feel a lot of things. Some people cry. I'm going to show you an example here of someone crying with their auto suggestions. If you have the right ammo structure and thriving nature, you want to then SOC or observe the new feelings. And you want to let that be programmed. Just let that wash over you. And you repeat. And you build your library or your farm, basically, of auto suggestions to both, number one, reprogram your mind in the long term, but to also rescue yourself from dire moments. So going back to this again, you know, the more, the more effective your auto suggestions become, the more you reprogram this. That's one purpose. The second purpose is. Sometimes we're going to find ourselves in the short term to be, hey, we're still operating by our old paradigms here. So when something happens, we're going to break our bulletproof vest. When you do that, you can use this process to rescue yourself, to shift that paradigm in the moment, right? But of course, the main goal is the longer term goal, where I want to program these new paradigms so that this interpretation that I make is naturally and reflexively good or positive or healthy for you. Being a farmer is slower and it's harder at first. It's very easy to just do some breathing exercises, et cetera, to rescue yourself in the moment, but it's better and more fun in the long run because what actually happens is something like this, okay? So as you build your library, you will pick the lowest layer of the big 14 and you raise it up. You pick the next layer and you raise it up. You pick the next layer and you raise it up. You pick the next layer, you raise it up, up, uh, oh, sorry, up, right, up. And eventually, now you have a higher baseline. And as you do this, you keep finding the weakest layer, the mind virus layer that is weak. You, um, 
you SOC, you shift that, it goes higher and higher and higher. And this is how we get better and better and better at the internal shifts over time. And this is a never ending cycle, right? And a lot of our clients actually have a lot of fun doing this. So here's someone, um, one of my clients creating a, a perfect product auto suggestion. This is one of the victim mindset that we have. And she's posting a video here of her doing this and look at the love the encouragement, the ideas she gets on this, right? It's amazing. It's, it's, it's a culture where we actually love doing this. You know, it's really fun too, because, you know, there's really only really 14 big auto suggestions that I have to address each of the big 14. And each time I visit it, they get better and better and better and better. So it's almost like um, improving your portfolio of internal shifts over time. It becomes kind of like a fun game. And it also becomes fun because Whenever I find myself breaking my bulletproof vest, I never ever stay too long in it. Like if I stay unbulletproof or broken for 10 minutes, I know I failed. Because as soon as I find myself broken, I observe that. I pull out one of my um, auto suggestions in my library. I listen to it. I watch it sometimes. And I, sh I, I shift it right away, right? And I rescue myself right away. And I reframe this right away. So I never really stay bulletproof or bulletproof less for more than 10 minutes. And so imagine when you can live a life where you have this library of auto suggestions that you have used to program your paradigm so that for 90% of cases, your interpretations are naturally positive, but also even when they're negative, you can rescue yourself very, very fast, right? Think about how powerful that is. And we go back to the why again. Think about if you can do that, if you can be someone who can make everything, spin everything into a positive thing, you can see everything as an opportunity. Can your partner feel safe? Wouldn't that be someone your partner can admire? Do you think it would be easier to align? Do you think your partner will get wet? Being around someone like that. And I can tell you, you know, um, for my partner, you know, uh, we're right now facing the best moments of our relationship. And recently she went to Cancun with her friends. And when she came home, this is what she said to me. You know, Jeff is funny, right? Uh, I wake up, uh, so you wake up an hour earlier than me. And whenever you wake up, you make a lot of noise and you shower, you, uh, uh, you get undressed, you change, whatever it is. You make a lot of noise. But I sleep like a baby when I'm at home. But when I'm outside... Even though I'm in my room, in a very nice hotel room, I don't sleep as well. And we know because we have this aura ring to tell us. And, and I realized that that's how safe I feel with you. And because she feels the safety, she can now surrender to their relationship. She can now surrender to her feminine state, which made her very seductive, which made her very passionate as a person. Before, she was never thinking about this because she was busy self-preserving because I wasn't taking care of my shit. She was scared. She was protecting herself. If she's saying like, well, he's not wearing the pants. He's not protecting us. He's not making us feel safe. He's not doing what he needs to do. So I need to put on my own pants too take off, and take off my skirt. Same thing for alignment, same thing for admiration. So this right here, do you see how this process right here can be the most important process you can have? Okay, so that's a video on internal shifts. So there I showed you the what they are, the why they are, the how they are. And guys, if you want to join, um, if you want to explore more about this program and learn more about this program, we have a masterclass for you that um, runs about an hour and a half long. At the end of the masterclass, we'll show you how you can apply for the program if you want to. Uh, so if you want to learn more, I'll put the link in the description below, also up above here. But if you know, if you want, if you have any questions on this, if you want me to follow up deeper on any parts of this video right here, so leave a comment below. I would love to hear from you, and I would love to be able to make a video, a follow-up video about this stuff because this stuff is so so crucial. All right, guys. So hope that was helpful. I'll see you guys in the next video.